Again, welcome everyone. I am Arne Van Alstrup here, the Chief Learning Officer at the Consortium for Service Innovation. And um, I lead the training and certification arm of the consortium. And if you could uh, tee up the next slide, Sean. Yep. And uh, the consortium is a nonprofit alliance of member companies uh, developing innovations to improve engagement in a variety of areas, um, including customer service, HR support, IT support, sales, and customer success, to name a few. And it's always awesome to hear on new applications that we hear the broader community is, is applying KCS to. And uh, next slide, we're funded predominantly by our member companies. And uh, we'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. And included here are the benefactor and sponsor level members. And then also want to make sure you are aware of upcoming events. And so in July, I come here from a KCS Align vendor, actually our, our newest Align vendor, XFIND AI, and their um, serial is going to be talking about new capabilities and concepts of AI and customer support. And Kelly Murray, our chief engagement officer, will be posting a link to the July event in the chat. But for today's KCS in Action, I am pleased to introduce um, Dr. Sean McNiven. And Sean is the head of research and the strategic program architect for SAP Global Product Support. And Sean will be sharing with us uh, SAP's innovative approach to knowledge article reviews and associated scoring. And he'll also cover um, how they approach the article reviews with their coaches, as well as their automation and AI roadmap. But some housekeeping before we begin. This session is recorded and will be posted to the consortium site as well as sent out to all who have registered. But please put yourself on mute during this event and please post your questions in chat. And Sherry Winnis, our, she's our, the KCS V6 certified trainer at SAP, she's going to be monitoring the chat and will either answer them in the chat, uh, bring them up as appropriate to Sean in the flow, or save them for the Q&A session at the end. And we're going to include the final chat transcript along with the presentation uh, and the recording in our email to those who have registered. And I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Sean. Thanks, Anfin. Um, me too. So great to be here. And I will have a lot to get through, so I won't dally too much. So a short, um, short agenda here, just so you know what you're getting yourself into with this talk um, to begin with bit about SAP product support and myself. Then the second section is called Being Human, not to do with the UK television program, but partially inspired by um, looking at uh, some of the aspects of you know, peer review process, et cetera, when we're dealing with other human beings. Then we have the KCS Knowledge Peer Review as we have implemented it at SAP, um, the insights and implications of that particular process. And then uh, a little about um, the automation that we're looking at already, that we've implemented already, um, implementation of AI and the future for this process, and then summary and questions. So I'll get straight to it. For those that don't know SAP, um, I actually live in Germany, so it's, uh, it's pretty ubiquitously known here and in most of Europe, but I know in the US when I've been there, it's not always as well known. So SAP is a market leader for enterprise resource planning software. Uh, it was founded in 1972, so it's uh, in its 51st year now. Over 100,000 employees worldwide and around close to 30 billion in uh, revenue for 2022. Um, SAP has a lot of customers, generating 87% of the global total global commerce, and 99 of the 100 largest customers uh, companies in the world are SAP customers. And the rest you can read yourself. It's um, it's, it's a large company, a good company to work for. That leads to the subdivision that I'm uh, employed by, which is SAP product support, um, potentially the most relevant to this, this group. So here we have some basic facts. These are the latest facts and figures from 2023, obviously dating back to 2022. So we have around 3,000 support engineers in the organization and uh, additional supporting staff for those support engineers. Um, around 350 E2Es, so end-to-end -end coaches, uh, recently rebranded or reconfigured as support team coaches that have a lot more responsibility than, um, than just knowledge, also looking at the entire case process now, so an extended role. Um, we are distributed across 21 locations, have over a million cases a year, 
and uh, 85,000 expert chats in 2022 with around 21 million knowledge base article views. So that's the context, um, SAP and SAP product support. Um, in terms of channels that we that we offer, so we have obviously self-service incident prevention, um, looking at the support portal, knowledge base articles, translation, guided answers, etc. We then have channels for real-time interactions, such as the expert chat, schedule an expert, ask an expert peer, um, and, and so forth. The digital support experience. So this is really looking at um, so the trust center and social media, including the community, which is an important uh, element of the overall support landscape. Predictive and preventative support, built-in support, so support within the products themselves, um, and, and various other approaches. And finally, the forward-looking future aspects of a support organization is, of course, then the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, now more than ever, it seems to have gone mainstream with the, with the launch of ChatGPT and co. Um, obviously, this predates those, those uh, more popular um, platforms. Transformers have been around for quite a few years. But looking at these technologies um, certainly is part of the overall process as well. <clears throat> and we have uh, some um, the incident solution matching tool and various other, other tools already implemented and are now looking to extend that significantly where it makes sense. So for myself, I'll try not to spend too long on that. I'm head of research for the Global Support Organization uh, at SAP. I joined 18 years ago, so I'd be regarded as quite a veteran. Um, I'm actually based in the, in the headquarters in Waldorf in Germany, uh, although I'm originally from New Zealand, grew up in Australia and half Scottish. Oh, wow. uh, I'm responsible for around 3,000 support engineers, so looking not, not responsible for them, but rather developing platforms, technologies, processes um, through research-driven intelligent automation. So really looking at the entire journey, I look at, um, at, at the engineers and the customers in terms of, of their actual life cycles, of their, their journeys through the platforms, what does an engineer do? And at each step of the way, ask yourself the question, can, can it be automated? How can I simplify this? Our driving philosophy uh, is to minimize effort um, always. And so that's what we're looking at whilst maximizing impact at the same time. So it's a good optimization problem. Previously, so before the development organization, I was in the, um, sorry, before the support organization, I was in the development organization where I led uh, research around developer culture, organizational research, uh, organizational design, um, various other aspects, particularly employee engagement was a big focal point. Before that, I was in the office of the CEO, uh, where I led the communications um, uh, innovation and social media teams. So basically, during that time, developed most of the internal and external social media platforms for, for SAP's um, PR department or global communications department, uh, including a really, really influential partnership with Forbes um, that's become very successful for them as well. So that was my previous life. In 2021, I was uh, fortunate to win, to be one of the winners of the Hustle Partner Award, which is the sort of preeminent employee um, recognition award of SAP for uh, my contributions to the SAP support assistant. And otherwise, I'm a researching practitioner, so very much practically oriented research, not too theoretical, but how can research be applied to direct, you know, to, to generate impact um, to this end as well. For that, I earned a doctorate in, in business administration, focusing on social influence within online uh, enterprise social media, um, looking at language reviews, et cetera, across a large corpus of data. And outside of that, I'm also a um, uh, honorary and visiting professor at two universities where I supervise PhD students and also engage in research. So I'm engaged in the, the, the enterprise and academia and uh, keep myself connected to both and they, they kind of enrich one another. So otherwise, I'm happy to connect with anyone that wants to on LinkedIn. If you put KCS in action as the subject line, uh, I'll know to accept you immediately. Right. Moving right along. Now, this, this section is actually more about interaction here, so it'd be great if, uh, if you could answer the, the questions. There'll be two little quiz questions, and um, there, there are reasons for that. They're not trick questions. The idea is to answer them as quickly as possible and as intuitively as possible as you can, so don't overthink it, um, but really just try and answer them as you can. Uh, Anfin, will you be able to? There you go. Okay. So. Um, Exactly. Which city has more inhabitants? Geneva or Guild? Uh, 
supposed to tell him not to Google, Sean. <laughs> yeah, no, don't Google. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A few more seconds, see if we can get everyone answering it. Um, brilliant. So that's excellent. Keep that in mind um, for the next question as well. So the next question is, uh, is this one here? Can we uh, ask the next one as well? So we had uh, 69 to 31 for that one, just to keep that in mind. Second question, if we can already pull the poll up for that. Wow, how are they doing it so quickly? Wow. Now it's actionable. Yeah. All right, that's pretty close. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, share results, so 58 to 42%. Um, good. All right, I will go to the next slide then and explain what these questions were about. So question one, most people chose Geneva. It was, I think, 69 to 31 or something, so around 70% around to 30 those that chose Biel, it's a question as to why, maybe thinking it was a quick trick question, but this is actually what's known as the take the best heuristic. And it's a way that um, uh, using the recognition um, heuristic that if you've heard of one place, especially in terms of city size, sporting events and various other things uh, of, of that nature, this actually performs very, very well. It's, it's a heuristic. So you could say it's a bias in a sense because you're using a, a shortcut but because it tends to be positive, you'd, you'd refer to it as a heuristic or a, uh, a, a sort of trick, basically. Um, and the Germans would call it a donkey bridge, an Eselsbrücke. In any case, um, this, this aspect here really is, is very helpful because you recognize it. It's because you've heard it more often. It actually correlates very, very strongly to the size of the city or the importance of a sporting event or anything of that nature. So this is an example where cognitive shortcuts can actually be very beneficial. In the second one, we have what's called the base rate fallacy. So we are often, this, this was, there were, there were more people that chose librarian over farmer. Now those that got farmer got it right, but whether they got it right for the right reason or not is another question. But in any case, uh, we tend to be narrative creatures. So we, we, are, we will overemphasize or you know, um, assign more importance to, to factors of personality, et cetera. So thinking, well, Steve probably is more likely to be a librarian based on, uh, on all these factors about his personality. But actually, there's a 56 times higher probability of Steve being a farmer just because the base rate of male farmers to male librarians is so much higher. Um, this was based in the US. And this is from uh, Tversky and Kahneman, uh, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics for his work around decision making and system one and system two thinking. So in this case, we're, we're overemphasizing the narrative importance and failing to account for the base rate of a given uh, probability. So right answer and right reason. Those that pick Steve as being li more likely to, uh, to, to be a farmer, good, it's correct. If you chose Steve because you thought of how many male farmers there are compared to male librarians, better still. If not though, this can lead to these sorts of decisions where you get it right, but not for the right reason, can actually lead to problems in the sense of what's called outcome bias. So by, by having this, this by, by being right more and more times, you start to sort of you know, uh, overvalue the, the outcome rather than the process that led to it. And this can re reinforce that, lead to that outcome bias. And effectively, it's, it's one of the many things that leads to management by intuition. And unfortunately, it's more uh, prevalent among more experienced managers because they have more personal experience to draw from and uh, a higher likelihood of actually suffering from outcome bias, which is why you need to look at processes. And that's, that's sort of you know, one of the major points of this presentation is to think about the processes that we employ, not just the outcomes. So if you did account for it, brilliant. 
Um, I don't think I did when I first got this question, so <laughs> don't feel bad about that. When you don't have much time, you make an, uh, an intuitive decision, and often it's based on things like narrative. So another example of right answer and not right reason is ice cream and drowning, the correlation. So if you look at these two charts here, there is, there is a clear correlation in terms of the two graphs moving. Ice cream consumption increases. As it does, the rate of drowning, death by drowning, increases as well. And so you might say ice cream consumption causes death by drowning, um, which obviously we'll all, you know, most probably think to ourselves, well, that makes no sense. That's, that's nuts. Um, and it is because the true reason for it is, is, of course, changes in temperature. Ice cream consumption increases as temperature increases. People go swimming more often when it's warm. And so the chances of drowning are also higher. And so this is what's known as confounding, where a third unmeasured or unknown variable is actually the cause of both of the variables of interest. But you can still predict with this. If you know the ice cream consumption rates, you can actually use it to predict increases or changes, fluctuations in death by drowning. So here's an example of a spurious correlation that still makes it possible to make potentially meaningful predictions or useful predictions if all you know is ice cream consumption. And this is where we then get to this idea of different types of analysis. So descriptive is what's happening. And it's what we, you know, as, as an absolute minimum, this is what our dashboards are comprised of. They're comprised of means, av like averages, uh, median values, perhaps trend lines, what's happening over time. Then we'll typically go straight to predictive and try and use that data to form correlations, et cetera, and understand of, well, if this is what's happening, looking at trend lines and time series analysis and all the rest, what's gonna happen next? And that is exactly that, you know, looking at the ice cream consumption and seeking to predict um, potential threats in terms of death by drowning. And then you ask yourself, what can we do about it? So if we know there's going to be an increase in this, in this one thing, we can, in a certain limited way, actually do something against it um, to, to, to minimize the death by drowning, because we know that we're going to have a greater prevalence of it. But if we don't know what the actual cause of it is, and that's where we get to the diagnostic analytics then it's very difficult to reliably make any prescriptive decisions. And this is this diagnostic analytics is very, very rarely uh, considered in, in, in industries or in analyses in general. People typically talk about descriptive, predictive, prescriptive, but miss the diagnostic. And the diagnostic is actually the causal analysis. So it's why things happen. Some of the best companies in the world in terms of design and experience, et cetera, will, will, will run A-B tests. Google has been running them since 2000, it runs hundreds and hundreds of A-B tests um, a year. Every new feature gets A-B tested where one group is randomly assigned one treatment and the other group is assigned a control. And then you look at the statistical differences. And this is the gold standard also in medical research and medical as research in general. Sometimes you can't run experiments and that's also okay because what you can do is called causal inference where you take observational data. So all of the data that's, that, that you already have there of what people are doing, all the interactions that they have, et cetera. And with the right methods, you can actually kind of estimate effects that are similar to an experimental. It's called quasi-experimental procedures. And this is where diagnostic analytics is super important. So just in general, to summarize that aspect, our human nature applies as much to who we are, who we vote for, and who our friends are as it does to how we evaluate the quality of knowledge. And as a rule, or we seek a second or third opinion and favor robust and explainable processes over outcomes. Just for anyone interested, I gave a more extensive talk on this topic of analytic, um, of diagnostic analytics, um, causal inference, et cetera. And I have the link here for anyone that's interested. So now we can get straight to the KCS knowledge peer review. The article quality index, the AQI, consists of these eight questions. Is the KBA unique? Is the title relevant? Are the KBA properties set appropriately, metadata, et cetera? Is the question or issue clear and understandable? Does the KBA answer the question problem presented? Does it meet the content standard guidelines? Are the links and or attachments valid and accessible? And is the KBA free of any data protection or security policy issues? So these are the eight questions. We have different weightings for questions one and eight. We'll talk about that later on as well. But this is basically what we're looking at in terms of quality. And the way that we obtain this um, now in the new system is that we basically have this sidebar here uh, in our integrated support environment. The KBA is loaded. There are automatic scans now conducted. So we have question one here, is the KBA unique? And already we have similar KBAs. Is the title relevant? Quick answer here is the next, are the fields filled out correctly? 
go straight to the next one. Uh, content clear, understandable. Does it answer the question problem presented? Yes, <laughs> slower than expected. Does it meet the content standard guidelines? Actually, uh, quite a complicated question, but good. This is automated now as well. Links and attachments found and accessible. Uh, here we found no broken links, so this is good. And already we can now look at security issues. A PII text scan has been done, and now the uh, AQI can be marked as complete. So you see along the way, along those eight questions, we have some examples of automation. We'll talk about that a little bit in the future uh, soon as well. But this is a process now to make it very simple. Previously to launching this tool, uh, we had everything in service now, and you had to sort of switch screens a lot and have this in separate windows, and it was a lot more convoluted. Having a sidebar approach makes it very, uh, very convenient. Plus, it gives us the ability to do this uh, peer review. So the challenge as well that led to this product, uh, to, to this being developed, was that we were confronted with Works Council concerns about objectivity and the potential for, um, for a coach to have uh, too much power over the, the, the sort of career of an engineer in the sense that they're responsible for doing all of the approvals in the beginning and later on they're doing all the reviews and a certain quality is required in order for an engineer to progress in the KCS levels. We have three of them. Um, and there was there, there's a lot of potential for bias in that uh, context as well. So the other aspect is, of course, that a relationship forms that the, the coach is connected somehow, has a relationship to the engineer that they're coaching. Uh, friendship may even develop along the way, so it's difficult to be fair and impartial. The second thing is that the reputation of the coach is also tied to the quality of the work done by their coaches. So there is a vested interest in the success of the coaches as well. And finally, it's not an equal relationship, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and any biases that exist can be magnified over time. So the, the response to this that I developed was uh, based on research processes. So when a, when a journal article is, research, is, is submitted, it goes to peer review. And that peer review is typically randomized uh, among a certain number of academics that will read your paper and critique it and decide whether or not it belongs um, in, in the journal. And it should be a blind peer review as well. So they don't see who the authors are. Any reference to authors is removed so that it should be as blind and, and impartial as possible. And that's at the heart of, of you know, all academic um, publication, really. Um, and so using that as inspiration, again, having that combined academic and, and practitioner uh, perspective um, made it quite a clear sort of uh, next step to consider this for, for these reviews. So this was the power of randomness, and now it's not personal in that sense. Two coaches are chosen randomly from a pool of 350 to review a KBA. This basically effectively eliminates the challenges in the beginning of relationships developing, et cetera, because the chances of a coach, um, of, of, of an engineer who's being reviewed, KBA is being reviewed, being reviewed by their own coach is about 0.6%. Um, so even if that did happen, uh, in a disproportionate amount of times, it would still be a lot smaller or lower than, um, than, than any other approach. So it effectively eliminates that, that process. Plus, any sense that the coach has that they can't review this person or how do they say no or how do they give the person a bad review, um, all of that vanishes as well because they know that this is a random review. They should not know the coach, or the, the engineer in most cases. Um, and there's also this desire or this, this mandate to be impartial about it. So this, this really helps in that sense of, of randomizing the reviews and making it a lot more objective. And also was then you know, greeted fervently by the German Workers' Council uh, who were thrilled to, to see this kind of robust approach implemented. Uh, just in terms of how it works out, we have this, this review. So in general, an engineer's coach will get a KBA to review. They will review it and then it gets published. This is for KCS 1 and 2. So KCS level 1 and 2, engineers cannot publish external KBAs on their own. Uh, it must be approved by a coach. Uh, once they hit KCS 3, they are empowered to publish alone, and you'll typically only have spot checks um, of the work done. But what we want to have, of course, is that when there are questions of progression or overall quality of the entire knowledge base itself, then we need to have this random review. So two coaches are chosen at random, uh, the KBA is also chosen at random, and then they review. And if they both agree, then the AQI is published. Brilliant. We've got two random coaches who have reviewed this KBA, and they both said that it's okay, and it gets published. If they disagree, 
We have an arbitration step where a third coach is randomly chosen from the, um, from, from the uh, pool of coaches to arbitrate only on the questions where there was disagreement. And then you have a quorum, basically. So you're going to always have two out of three for each question once you add a third person. Um, and then it gets published with the results of the quorum. And what we're looking at next is, is for the process adherence reviews as well, looking at case quality, um, potential for cases to lead to KBAs and all the rest. And so this process that is now live for coaches and has been for some time is effectively just being refined now. And we're looking at the next stages for doing reviews overall for the quality of, of cases. So question three, I'm gonna, if we can pull this final question up, yes. If you gave two random coaches, one randomly chosen KBA to review, how often do you think they would agree on the quality of that KBA? That look good. That's looking good. Would you like to share those results? Are these visible now for everyone? I, I can't see. Yeah. They should be. Yeah. yeah so. Um, okay. I found this on the web for they should be. Check it out. <laughs> nice. Um, yes. Yeah, so as we can see here, greater than 80%, 22%, 71 to 80, 22%, 61 to 70, 16%. So what do we have? 44, 50, 60%, uh, 70, 77% have said 51 or higher. Um, and then the remaining people have said, no, it's gonna be lower than that. So we put everyone out of their misery and give you the results. 46% of the time. So actually most people were optimistic. Um, we have approximately, well, 46% of the time, so option four, 41 to 50, uh, we got a full, a full agreement um, by the two coaches and there was no need for arbitration. But 54% of the time, it had to be arbitrated by a third person for one or more questions. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's pretty awful. And what's going on? We have to remember the complexity of this question as well. but well, let me get to some of the insights and implications of this. So here we have our dashboard <clears throat> and I'll go into, into specifics of this. You can see the trend lines here is probably most important to look at. Uh, the quality overall you can see is, is, is high regardless. I have two lines here. One looks at the original weighting um, that you saw in the beginning with full eight questions and the other I took questions two and seven and gave that a score. It's slightly lower than the higher rating, um, but not drastically so. So this is, this is a good way of testing also which questions to include in the AQI, whether it makes sense to have all eight, to weight them the way that they've been weighted or whether there should be other approaches taken. Uh, in any case, what we have, you see the agreement, it fluctuates a bit, but it does sort of, it ranges across the entire corpus. It's now 50, 46%. It has improved a bit. If you look at week by weeks, so you'll get some weeks where it's 60, 70. Uh, you know, for, this is for, uh, per 20 AQIs basically. And here you can see the quality. So if I go to the next level here, oh, sorry, yes. Um, the other aspect is that in the past four weeks, our adoption of the uh, SDC compliance has risen uh, to 14%, and the time to complete has also dropped uh, in the past four weeks. But this can be an anomaly. In any case, you, know, you, you see that the ability to obtain massive amounts of insights now from the simple process is, is given when you, when you own the sort of E2E -E process itself. So the median times actually dropped from four minutes 51 to three minutes 39 in the past four weeks, uh, which is nice to see. We'd have to look at those trends uh, more closely though. So if we look at quality, which are the questions that are causing the problems um, in terms of quality? And we see two outliers here. So duplicates, subject clear, content clear solution, links resolved and security check are all very high in terms of the um, quality. 
Um, but we see that the fields complete, so metadata, et cetera, which is quite a complex um, question in its own right. You have to check many things. So here is a, you know, an, an opportunity to, to fail uh, or you know, to, to not meet the uh, criteria. And the content standards are basically three pages of small font uh, in, in terms of, or at least the last time I looked at it, there's a lot. The content standards guidelines are, are quite um, extensive. Um, so we see here that these are two of the questions that are actually causing some of the drops in quality. Um, in terms of agreement, though, we see even more red. So not surprisingly, because we have this 45.8% agreement uh, or 46% and this 54% disagreement, um, we see now that um, the content standards, again, question six, are causing some of the you know, most frequent 33% of the time this, this leads to disagreement. Um, and again, question three has the second highest at 22.8%. Again, not surprising because both of these questions are um, complex questions. So it's not a simple yes or no. And if you consider that this final overall bar chart here with 45.8 and 54.2 is the result of any disagreement across any of these eight questions, then the 46% agreement may not be as bad as it sounds. We might expect 70 or 80% agreement because for many human uh, agreement tasks like sentiment analysis in social media, et cetera, you would expect 80, 85 to 90% agreement in some cases about whether it's positive or negative or ironic or whatever else. But that's a very simple question. And even there, you don't have anywhere close to 100% agreement. So if we look at a process like this, we can see that it's a lot more complex and actually, I don't want to say that 46% is good. I think we can do a lot better, but we now know where some of the major problems are. So the other aspect that's important is to look at the, the dashboard in terms of time as well. How much uh, time are people spending? And so we have time timers built into each page of the AQI. Um, there's also an additional timer for read time, uh, which is not included here because this is the questions. But we see by far the, the largest amount of time is actually spent looking at duplicates. Um, even though we do have automation for it with the recommender. You can see here that although the median time is only half a minute, the 75th, so the, the third quartile, which basically means 75% of the time it takes. Um, so upper fence here is, is, is the outliers, but the Q3 is basically two minutes. So 75% of people <clears throat> need around two minutes or less to determine whether it's an outlier, like whether it's a duplicate or not. Um, overall, though, before the real outliers start, it can take even longer. It's up to five minutes. Um, and then we see our median time, though, 50% of people spend less than half a minute on it. So we have, we have the ability to look at these with these box plots, and we can say this is how much time is being spent for each of these questions. And again, we see question six is our, um, is, is, is our problem question here. It also takes second uh, largest amount of time for the seventh for the third quartile. Although question three actually takes the second largest amount of time in terms of the median values. Uh, in any case, again, these two questions appear. So we now have a lot, we know a lot more about this process than we knew at the beginning. Um, and we can see all of this together now in the overall dashboard, where you also see then the total AQI score here and the time it takes. So the median time is 291 seconds. <clears throat> so every 50% of the people take less time than that. The reason, of course, um, that I chose a median rather than an average is because you have massive outliers. You have some people taking 29,000 seconds for a question. Obviously, these are outliers. If they were averaged across even 1,000 AQIs, it would be a massive skewing of the data because it's non-normal. But a median, a median value rather than a mean value uh, is not, not impacted much by outliers because it's just looking at the order of, of time scores across the entire data. So outliers are going to have a very small effect on it. Um, you see here the median times for each of the questions. Obviously, they do not add up to the 291 seconds because um, that's the aggregate time overall. But it's good to be able to see this. We can see the quality as well. Now, we have the two sections here, and this is why I highlighted these, these earlier. Although it's questions one and eight, we see these effectively as corpus level or K-based level questions. So these are knowledge-based level questions. The duplicate is about how searchable uh, is the data, uh, how quickly can people find it. And the security check is, of course, about compliance. You know, you don't want customer data appearing in a knowledge base article. So for me, these are absolutely prerequisites. And we're discussing this in the team as well. 
as to whether these need to be included in the AQI, which is more about individual document indicators. The questions two to seven are really the document level indicators, whereas questions one and eight, absolutely essential, but they probably should be their own metrics in their own right. And we wouldn't necessarily have known this either again, you know, without having access to all of these data. And finally, I like to think about the fact that this AQI, with the way that we've implemented it as a sidebar, with automated, um, with, with many of the questions already automated or semi-automated, um, that it takes about three to four minutes. So about the time to make a good cup of, of, of black or green tea. And that helps then to scale that. And the reason that we only have 14% uh, adoption right now of, or compliance for our support team coaches is the process is still quite new um, and we're still you know, onboarding a lot of people and also making it clear as to what the value is of this and why this needs to be done. And ultimately, we're hoping to get a lot more of these done per week, um, considering that it doesn't take long. And that will enable us to really uh, canvas a great deal of our knowledge base and have a real rep representative sam sample of the knowledge and be able then to speak about the quality of the knowledge, changes to the process, and, and also looking at the overall, you know, watching the watches or reviewing the reviewers themselves by looking at the overall process and the agreement scores uh, across coaches reviewing this and where the guidelines themselves may be complicated. So in summary, the process can be improved and now we know what can be improved. And this is only going to this is only going to be confirmed as we get more data. But now, as we make changes, we can see this in a very fine level of granularity. Every twenty KBAs, uh, every twenty AQIs that are conducted leads to a new data point. So any changes that we make in those trend lines that you saw earlier, we can now uh, you know very easily say, okay, now we're going to implement a new system. We're going to implement a checklist. We're going to do this or that, and we can actually see. We would expect those questions and the agreement levels to then be improved, and the quality to then be improved. So here we can see disagreement, the KBA is unique. These are the three things that we might want to focus on. We are looking at as next steps, um, question one and six because of the time that they take and uh, three and six also because of large disagreement and that it has the lowest quality, still high, but lowest of, of the others. This leads us to the, the final section, which is automation AI in the future. So if I again, squish these together just for reference, how might we make improvements to these, uh, these elements? Well, is the KBA unique? This is clearly about improving the recommender engines that we're using. Uh, when those checks are conducted at the beginning of the AQI, whilst the coach is reading the KBA, we're running these checks, we're looking for links, et cetera, and we're also looking for similar KBAs and we're providing a list of the top five closest matches. The coaches tend to still search, which is good. But over time, they should need to search less because we should then see as they're searching, they're not finding anything that's not been found already. And over time, we would expect them to be able to really take the burden away from coaches to have to search too much. Then we'd be running spot checks to make sure that uh, what the recommender is providing is actually good enough. Is the title relevant to the content? We can look at things like, for example, similarity scores. So you can look at the words that have been chosen in the description. You can look at the statistical frequency of words in the actual body of the KBA as well and calculate similarity scores. This is something we have not done yet, but it's something that we're looking at and we'll be able to do with basic text analysis, especially with the, uh, the power of the new models. Um, here is really about automated checklists. So the KBA property is set appropriately. We have not automated this yet, but it's on our roadmap to do so. And because question three was one of the questions that had some of the biggest problems in terms of disagreement and quality, um, this could be a real quick win for us to just simply automate those checks. We're looking at metadata that, you know, where the fields have been filled out completely and appropriate, et cetera. A lot of this could be done by a machine and probably better and faster um, than by a human. Uh, and also it's the sort of work that is not enjoyable for people. So if the machine can help us, then we should be using that. Whether it's understandable or not, we actually have readability scores using the basic um, existing re uh, readability scores. And we compare a given KBA to the other KBAs in the same product family. And we give it a percentile value. And if it's within you know, the top 20%, it gets full points. If it's 60 to 80, it gets you know, less, and if it's sort of average, and if it's lower than that, then, then we'll sort of flag it as potentially difficult, because actually the readability of knowledge-based articles is quite um, low in general, because it's, you know, it's a complex topic, 
So it's you, most people who are reading knowledge based articles are highly educated. You know, these are people working in companies that have to read these support engineers. These are also customers that work on a technical side. So they do need to have a high degree of literacy, which makes sense that knowledge based articles are going to have lower readability scores than uh, a lot of other text types. And that's OK. But we have not had the greatest success with it yet because the readability is still you know, far, far from perfect and we still haven't got a really useful measure of it. But here you can see some of the things you can do. Q&A matching can be done for whether the KBA answers the question or problem. Again, with GPT type models, um, they are designed and fantastic with Q&A, trained on the right data. This can be very helpful. Similarly here, question six is like question three. Again, automated checklists. We can do a lot to take away the pain of engineers uh, and coaches in that process of going through the many, many content standard guidelines. And I think we can automate that quite soon and we'll see you know, massive improvements to agreement and quality through the process. This is already automated. The quality is very high and disagreement is quite low. So already this, this step in automation takes very little time for engineers as well, but actually it would be very time consuming if they had to click on each of those links themselves and make sure that they resolve. So this was really a quick win. It's not even machine learning or anything. It's just using simple libraries um, that can be uh, done. And similarly here, we have also a library. I think it does use some machine learning. It's an existing SAP library that we use, but also quite successful. The quality is, is very good, but I flagged it as red because actually any violation of customer data is, is serious and should be taken seriously. So even though this is still very, very low uh, in terms of um, KVAs not meeting that particular guideline, we should, we should aim for 100%. No single KVA should be published that has any sort of uh, personally identifiable information. In it. So that's the process, but that's one side of the coin. The other side, of course, is that we're looking at moving from reviewer copilot to author copilot. So we've got the coaches now augmented by this process and by this peer review process. What's happening at the same time is that we're generating huge amounts of training data by looking at all the commentary as well, because every time um, someone says, no, this does not meet it, they are expected to comment as to why it doesn't. So we have a huge amount of qualitative data about why certain questions are being answered as false. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we have this, this robust peer review with the additional aspect of arbitration. So a very, very robust data set for training machine learning models. And the idea is now, this is the KBA editor, is to bring all of that into the KBA editor so that we move from review to creation. When the engineer is creating their KBAs, they should have all of that guidance at the beginning. So that the moment they send it, you know, nine times out of 10 or more, it's going to be fully compliant just of its, just from the beginning without any kind of reviews necessary. So the, the AI basically, or the, the co-pilot becomes the coach uh, or a, a continuous coach. This reduces the effort for coaches and their coachees, enables them to also target their coaching uh, a lot more effectively. And finally, what's gonna be really important is of course, that we generate knowledge-based articles directly from cases. And we're already looking at that and working on that as well. And that's why the whole uh, process adherence review process is gonna be one of our next things as well to make sure that cases themselves are compliant and how that connects to content standard guidelines. And in, the, in another project that I'm leading uh, at the moment for a, a case assistant, um, generating a KBA is one of the things that that case assistant does based on all of the, the pulse information that we're going to have, which is basically following that ETE -E process. So that's going to be the real game changer here. And that leads us to the summary and questions. And I'm happy that we've still got some time for Q&A. To summarize, being human, we're all human. One person reviewing content and quality and saying what is quality and what is not is just not enough. We, we have biases. These biases get magnified. And without checks and balances, we cannot reliably say that our knowledge base is, a, is, a, is of a high quality. We can't reliably say what quality is. Any changes that we make uh, could be arbitrary or could be magnified through those biases. And so it's absolutely essential that we have this kind of peer review type process in place where we can massively increase the objectivity of the process. That's what we have here. So this process uh, in, in three, the knowledge cases knowledge peer review effectively does that. And as we can see in, uh, in section four, we talked about the insights and the implications. Through this process, we've been able to identify questions in the AQI that are problematic, uh, not because they're not valid or useful, but because they may be too complex to have in a single question, because 
they may be effortful cognitively for, for, a, uh, for a coach to actually process. And because they may be perfect targets for automation uh, through AI, machine learning, or even just standard um, you know, computational methods. So now that we have this with you know, hundreds and hundreds, uh, I think 1,400 or so AQIs, so fully peer-reviewed AQIs conducted, um, and we're only going to extend, you know, magnify that further as, as we move forward, we now have some really, really good trends to look at that are going to help us with that. And then finally, we saw in section five, the potential for automation is massive, and uh, we've already begun to implement that in our existing system. We have been able to reduce the AQI process to the time it takes to make a cup of tea, and we're looking to do to you know, minimize that further. Um, and, and ultimately, I think that we can get this down to about 10% of the effort um, today. I think that ultimately we can get this down to a level where coaches will be doing spot checks of the machine learning methods um, that are being used and that we can then apply those methods to the entire corpus of knowledge at any given time and get a really, really robust uh, sense of the quality of our knowledge base at scale. And that's the presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. And again, if you wish to connect, I'm available on LinkedIn. Great. And, and Sherry, was there any unanswered questions from the chat? Um, there, there, I tried to answer most of them. I think there, there was a theme in there, and I thought maybe, um, Sean, you might want to talk to it a little bit. But um, one of the first things was around the pool of coaches that we have. We have 350. Well, yeah. we've got, I just want to kind of set the stage so everybody understands where, where we're at with that. So we have a coach for every 10 engineers that we have. Um, so that's why we have 350 some coaches. Um, that's pretty much average around that. So they are responsible to do the AQI, that initial AQI for their ones and their twos um, before that content gets released. And then once that happens, then it goes into this pool that Sean was talking about for that peer AQI review. And they're expected to do one random review a week. Um, and they can do more. If they've got time to do more, great. We'll keep feeding them more if they want to. Um, but the expectation is for them to set to do more or just one a week. Sorry. Um, so, Sean, I didn't know if you wanted to talk to like the amount of people for this to work in a pool, if there would be a difference around that at all. At all. Um, but, you know, as you said, we're just getting started with it and trying to get people um, ramped up on the whole process itself as well. So. No, I think I think you've covered it well, Shari. Um, I also just noticed my battery is almost dead and I didn't bring a charger. But um, I think if there are any other questions, uh, if, if for some reason this crashes, um, I <laughs> hope that you can answer any remaining questions. But okay. that, that's um, yeah, the, the the randomness is really important to have that with the coaches and and ultimately yeah, we're still we're still scaling it. So that's going to make a huge difference. But ultimately, it's, it really is also about the fact that this method provides massive training data for, um, for enhanced machine learning methods in the future as well. Yeah. And I just wanted to go off of, um, so we are working with our coaches today based off of the content that we got from the peer review, because we didn't really have a good insight into, are they really coaching the same? We would try to do collaboration meetings, meaning we would collaborate together on the same KBA as everybody answering the question the same way um, and so forth. But it was, it was difficult, right, to scale that across the amount of coaches that we have. So by being able to do this peer review, we can kind of tell, okay, they're struggling maybe with question three or question six that we need to look into further. Um, and that allows us then to do uh, more training with the coaches around that. It allows us to do, uh, maybe we have to go back and look at those questions. Maybe the questions have to be tweaked just a little bit to help them understand some of the pieces. Um, so it's been very beneficial even even though we haven't been doing this very long, just to recognize that we're not on the same page as we're doing these reviews from coach to coach. So it's been very beneficial that way. Uh, let's see here. Try not to skip anything question wise. Um, question around coaches reviewing content for products within their expertise across the company and reviewing content for which they may not have direct product expertise. So right now, uh, Jason, thanks for the question. Our uh, individuals 
that we're discussing about here today are all part of our digital uh, platform and core products. Um, so we've got other areas, other LOBs with inside of SAP as well, but right now we're focusing on our DCNP, sorry, it's our digital core and platform products, excuse me, DCNP folks, um, but they are getting sent content or KBAs that does not pertain to their product area. Um, and from an AQI perspective, those questions um, really don't have anything to do around a product. Is this technically accurate or anything like that? It is truly around how the content has been captured, how it's been um, uh, created. If there's duplicates out there, um, it has to do around um, um, the quality and the structure of the content. Is it easily found? readable, all of that uh, good information. So yes, they are reviewing content that is not probably within their product domain, basically. And, and this is Arthur, I saw another uh, earlier comment that if we had um, more random, uh, so what we recommend is that the person doing the review the coach doing the reviews, not the coach that actually coaches the coachee. And because uh, that's been a, an issue for many, um, certainly all the issues that um, Sean brought up, but just people don't want to judge their peers mm -hmm. and they don't mind if it's anonymous and random. And so we definitely recommend that as a best practice. And I know Jason was just in here in the, the chat and uh, that was the practice that uh, he had at Autodesk, and we know many others who do that. But we see many who have the coach do the um, AQI content standard checklist of their coachee, and that causes some issues. And again, we see that uh, uh, that's one of the reasons people don't want to be coaches, is they don't want to judge their peers. And we found that particularly in uh, um, Asia Pacific, that we have many companies have a, a big issue there. But um, so I wanted to bring that up because that definitely was a comment that was in there and wanted to clarify the, the best practice there. Yep. Any other questions? Oh, we have Nick from Motorola. He's asking if, um, not knowing the topic of the article uh, pertains to. So if you're not in that area, um, would you have a, an issue um, actually doing the uh, content standard checklist? Mm. So we, I mean, they. it's not like they don't read the content itself because um, they definitely need to do that for sure um, and make sure like the steps make sense. Um, if it all of a sudden it, they're, the steps kind of drop off and then, okay, well, what's that next step? That's where that coach would come back and, and probably state that in, uh, in the comments, like Sean said, that we're learning from is to make sure that they could take a look at that and understand that process. So um, from a readability perspective and easily follow what's going on, um, we have been able to do that without, without issue. I know the PAR review, that is one that we've been discussing um, with our coaches around, well, I don't know how to do this. So it will be interesting once we start looking at this in the future, how can we randomize that? Because I think that might have a little bit more uh, randomization being done probably within the product area, so our portfolio area. Great. Any other questions in chat? Looks like we, we covered those. All right. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you so much, Sean. And thank you, Sherry, for being out on this. This was a fascinating um, talk. And I think many are going to get some great nuggets out of this to apply in their, their space. And what's nice is you know, we have our aligned and verified uh, program I am getting more interest from aligned vendors who use AI to support things like the content standard checklist, AQI, and, and doing co-pilots and such. So that's some exciting things with all these tools coming in. So hopefully we'll be um, bringing some out as some aligned or verified tools to, to help support you all. But again, thank you very much. And you all have a great rest of the day.